So the first example we're going to look at is one dealing with just specific heat. So here what we have is uh, water, which has a mass of 3 kilograms <clears throat> and has an initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. And then inside of that, I'm going to drop a piece of copper, which has an initial temperature of 60 degrees Celsius and then uh, has a mass of one kilogram. And we want to know is what is the equilibrium temperature that this system achieves? So again, what's going to happen here is I'm going to have heat flowing out of the copper into the water, causing the water to increase its temperature while the copper decreases its temperature. Now here, the specific heat of copper is 387, where the specific heat of water is 4,186. Now, it's a good time to do a comment section. I should have done this in the last video, but we'll do it now. So let me ask you a quick question. So why is it that a person can walk across a bed of coals, right? like we do, they like to do in Hawaii and places like that, right? Get a tourist to walk across a bed of coals without actually burning your feet. So why is that possible? Well, let would you write in the comments, pause, write your answer, no cheating. Great. So let's look at the differences in these specific heats. <clears throat> So what is the difference between a large specific heat and a low specific heat? Well, a specific heat specifically talks about the amount of energy it takes to increase a substance's temperature by a single degree. Right? Now what this means then is the more of the substance I have, the more energy it takes to increase it by a single <clears throat> degree, and also the greater these specific heats, the more energy it takes for this thing to change its temperature by a single degree. What it means then is here, 387 for the copper means it doesn't take a lot of energy for this thing to change its temperature. But water has a very large specific heat, which means that it takes a lot of energy for it to change its temperature. Now, that brings us back to the question. So why is it I can walk across a bed of coals without actually burning my feet? Well, it's because of specific heat. We are mostly made of water, so we're going to have a specific heat somewhere around like 4,000. And we have a lot of mass, which means that it takes a lot of energy transferred from the coals to us to cause us to increase our temperature by a single degree. Now, does that mean I should walk and stand there? Well, no, I mean, I am going to burn my flesh if I actually do that. But if I simply walk at kind of a leisurely rate, in that case, it takes a lot of energy transferred into my foot to cause my foot to increase its temperature by a single degree because the specific heat of us is going to be something relative to that of water, <clears throat> which means it's going to be something very high. So in this case, I can actually walk across a bed of coals because I'm made primarily of water, so I have a very large specific heat, so it takes a lot of energy transfer to get my body to increase by a single degree. So anyway, so let's look at this problem. So again, what we now know is that we have to use calorimetry. So here, this is the calorimetry then is going to be equal to these uh, heat of the water plus then the heat of Luna. Now here I have no phase transition, so we're simply going to use specific heat. <clears throat> so this is now going to be equal to then the mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water plus then the mass of the aluminum times the specific heat of the aluminum. Oh, sorry, copper. Right, we're doing copper, not aluminum. There we go. Times the change in temperature of the copper. Now, what I know is that the final temperature for both the water and the copper has to be the same. Right? So I'm going to rewrite this then as the mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the final temperature, simply going to call that T, minus then the initial temperature of the water, plus the mass of the copper times specific heat of the copper times then the final temperature, minus then the initial temperature of the copper. Now again, what we know is going to happen here is that this temperature is going to go up, so this is going to be a positive change. This temperature is going to go down, which means that this is going to be a negative change. So this is going to be positive and this is going to be negative. Mm -hmm. Now here, what I want to do is solve for the final temperature. So I'm going to multiply both of these here. So I'm going to get this times this, this times that with a negative sign. This times this, this times that. I'm going to bring the two terms that don't have the final temperature to the other side. So I'm going to get the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the initial temperature of the water plus the mass of the copper times the specific heat of the copper times the initial temperature of the copper must all then be equal to 
Well, since this temperature is the same as this one, I'm going to simply factor it out. So this is going to be then the mass of the water times specific heat of the water plus mass of the copper times specific heat of the copper all times the temperature. Mm -hmm. So finally, if I solve this for the temperature, I'm simply going to divide both sides by this. So I get my final temperature then is equal to the mass of the water, specific heat of the water, initial temperature of the water, plus mass of the copper, specific heat of the copper, initial temperature of the copper, all divided by mass of the water, specific heat of the water, plus specific heat of the copper times the mass of the copper. Now, let's do a quick dimensional analysis here. So basically, this is M times C. This is also going to be N times C times the temperature, which means M times Cs are going to cancel. So this is going to be temperature is equal to temperature. So this thing has dimensionally correct. Plug in my numbers. What I find in this case then is this turns out to be 21.2 degrees Celsius. So let's do a quick, just make sure that this makes sense, right? So does this make sense? Well, yes. So again, what we said was that what, it doesn't take a lot of energy for this thing to change its temperature, which means that what? As the heat is flowing out, so since I have the same amount of heat here and here, just one is positive, one is negative, that means this one's gonna have a much greater change than this one is. Because this specific heat is so high, it takes a lot of energy for this thing to change its temperature by a single degree, which means that that energy which is flowing in barely causes this water to change its temperature also because there's more water than there is of aluminum but for the aluminum or for the copper I keep saying aluminum anyways it's relatively easy for that thing to shed off all of its temperature so in this case this is going to have a much greater temperature change than this one does so again we should expect that the final temperature is going to be closer to the temperature of the, in the initial temperature of the water which we can see that it is so let's do one more example. In this case, let's add some latent heat in here. And again, let's see what the difference is. So in this case, we're going to take a block of ice, uh, which has five kilograms, and we're going to drop that simply into some water. Okay. So let's say here again is our water. Okay, so here's our system of water. Um, so the mass of the water is equal to 40 kilograms. So that's a lot of water. <clears throat> uh, the initial temperature of the water is equal to 20 degrees Celsius. Inside of here, we're going to drop some ice. So here's my ice, where the mass of the ice is equal to uh, 5 kilograms. And then the initial temperature of the ice is equal to minus 5 degrees Celsius. So we want to know again, what is the final temperature of this system? So uh, we need a specific heat of the ice. We already know the specific heat of the water. So this is right, this is ice. So this is 2090 uh, joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Uh, we also need the latent heat of fusion for water. So that's 3.33 times 10 to the fifth uh, joules per kilogram. So this is our latent heat of fusion. So again, okay, all we're going to do is we're going to add the one thing to the other thing. And then here, what's going to happen now is that the heat is going to flow from the water into the ice. So just in the opposite direction as our previous case. And then here again, we just want to know what is our final temperature. Right. So again, this is thermally isolated, which means that the net Q must be equal to zero. So in this case, this is simply going to be Q of water plus... But again, here we're going to assume that the ice melts. So what has to happen then is we're going to take the ice, so Q of the ice, from the initial temperature of minus 5 to the final temperature of 0. Then we're going to add some latent heat of fusion because we need to melt it. And then we're going to add the water now. So this thing is now water. And we're going to bring that from 0 degrees up to the final temperature of T. Okay. So again, here, anytime I have latent heat, this thing is broken up into three pieces. I'm going to have to bring it from the initial temperature to zero. Latent heat of fusion, I have to melt it. And then I have to bring it from zero to the final temperature. <clears throat> Where again, this one and this one have to have then the same final temperature. 
So those are now going to be equal to the mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water plus, actually let me write it all out. So this is going to be times the final temperature minus the initial temperature of the water. Great. This is going to be plus the mass of the ice times specific heat of the ice times the final temperature, which is zero, minus the initial temperature, which is a minus minus, let me just do it this way, uh, minus the initial temperature of the ice, plus the latent heat of fusion, and this is plus because it's absorbing that uh, energy, so this is going to be the mass of the ice times then the latent heat of fusion, plus the mass of the ice, so again the mass of the ice doesn't change, that amount of ice which melts is still five kilograms, so that still stays the same. But now this is specific heat of water because now it is fully melted, so in this case it now has a different specific heat, times then the final temperature minus that initial temperature, which in this case is going to be zero. Now from here we're specifically looking for again this T and this T, so anything that is not that T we're going to simply bring to the other side. So finally we're going to get the mass of the ice uh, times specific heat of the ice, <coughs> pardon me, plus then the initial temperature of the ice uh, minus the mass of the ice times length of heat of fusion right, plus this term, so then I got uh, plus mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the initial temperature of the water and all that then must be equal to, so that's this term uh, this term, because this term is zero, this term, and then this term is also zero. So that's all going to be equal to now this term of this term, so this is now going to be specific heat of the water, because that's the same for each one, times then the mass of the water plus the mass of the ice. Times that temperature. Okay, so good. So finally, we're going to simply solve then for the final temperature. So now we can do that. So finally, we're going to get that the mass of the ice times specific heat of the ice times the initial temperature of the ice minus the mass of the ice times the latent heat of fusion plus the mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the initial temperature of the water all divided by the specific heat of the water times then the mass of the water plus the mass of the ice and all that is equal to the final temperature. So if I plug in my numbers what I find in this case then is that the final temperature should turn out to be about 9.18 Celsius. So, so these are two Examples, again, of heat changing internal energy. In this case, one with a phase transition, one without a phase transition. So <clears throat> we're slowly working our way to what's known as the first law of thermodynamics. So now we have to talk about one more thing before we get there, what's known as work. So we have to revisit work. So, so we'll talk about work in the next video.